somebody that asks me how we can change this situation, my first response is we need to go and revisit these drug policies. Drug prohibition does not work. And it doesn't, drug yeah. prohibition actually fuels county lines and fuels the violence that we see at the minute. So really, the first thing to do is decriminalise drugs and then really radically, some people won't like me for saying this either, is to legalise drugs and really change attitudes towards the people that use them, the people that depend on them and look at why people depend on them. So um, a really interesting statistic is 90% of all illicit drug use is not problematic only around 10% of um, illicit drug use or drugs that are illegal, 10% uh, is problematic. But we are made to believe that that 10% accounts for 100% of people that use those drugs, right? Mm. That is, to, go on, go on, mate. Oh, I was going to say that is interesting because you, you just assume that you're anyone with a drug problem or taking drugs all of the time and, and involved in crime or you know doing things that you shouldn't be. It's down to drugs where you, you then lose... You lose fact that there's ninety percent of drug takers who are just I don't know happily maybe responsible people that yeah. can make their own decisions and stop when they don't want any more and take them when they feel like having them and yeah ninety percent of people yeah and I th I would advise anybody who is interested in this to have a read of Professor Carl Hart's book so he is a professor I think at the University of Columbia in America and he is a heroin user and he's out and proud about it. He's done a lot of research into it. And what well, he's an open heroin user now. Yeah, works for a university, University of Columbia. <laughs> That's insane. Wow. Professor of psychology. I think maybe even runs the department of psychology in, in um, that university. And he is a heroin user and he actively um, discusses his heroin and other class A drug use. Grace, what's his name again? I'm going to have to... Professor have... Carl Hart C. Yeah, that's it. Carl Hart, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. And he functions okay and he's... Yeah, he's yeah. absolutely fine. In fact, he he's done a Joe Rogan podcast, so have a listen. He will say that his performance when he is on drugs sometimes is much better than when he's not on drugs. <laughs> so when he, so he, said, he said in this interview in his podcast <gasps> with uh, Joe Rogan that when he did his TED Talk, he'd actually had... I think it was methamphetamine the night before. I, I mean, wrong. meth is a heavy fucking drug, isn't it? I always think of people like... I mean, him. is he going as far as kind of advocating it and, you know... Yeah, yeah, he's trying to change drug laws. He is basically advocating for the fact that people should be free to make those decisions about whether they take drugs or not. So it said, I mean, there's just there's the thing, it says it's great to take MDMA with my wife and reconnect. So this guy doesn't mess about with his... Um... So his book is called um, Drug Use for Grown-Ups. Uh, beneath the social and moral debate, it is vit vital scientific question, are recreational drugs harmful in themselves? If skunk, MDMA, cocaine and heroin are dangerous to the individual and ruinous to the community at the large, then the case for banning them is strengthened. But what if they aren't as harmful as the authorities maintain? And what if the damage done to communities should be attributed to poverty and criminalisation of drugs rather than psychoactive effects? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So everything that we are led to believe about addiction is wrong and again i'm gonna try and instruct ask you to pull up another book because yep. people need to read it it's called chasing the scream chasing the scream and this was written by a guy called Johan ari i think that's how you say his name Oops, again sorry. he's done a joe rogan podcast yeah, it is, yeah, it's tough and one. his whole message of that book is the opposite of addiction is connection and basically everything that we know or we've come to know about addiction is wrong so obviously there are certainly chemical hooks in yeah. the drugs but actually the environment plays a huge factor and one thing i think is really interesting we were having this conversation the other day when you got blown up and you were in the hospital did you have morphine yeah and then did you come out of hospital addicted to morphine no why i don't know it's it's hard to get hard to get in bootle is it well, yeah, yeah. No, one, no one was offering it to me no one very it wasn't very easy there. to get in bootle oh, you know really? <laughs> yeah. morphine well it's heroin isn't it oh right yeah so yeah. you know if you go to the hospital you're given diamorphine which is the the medical term for heroin morphine is the exact same it's a, it's much more pure and it's much more safe because it's not bashed with anything that you find on the street 
yeah, no, I just didn't. I just wasn't addicted. I don't know. I had other things going on, I guess. <laughs> other back. things going on. You had a support network in place. You know, you you had all the qualities and factors that somebody needs to live a fulfilling life. A nice life, right? yeah. So you didn't become addicted to that. So why then, if the chemical hook is there, it's the same. If we're led to believe that these drugs are so chemically addictive, why then would you not walk out of the hospital with a heroin addiction? Why would you then not want to go and find a, street, a drug dealer on the street and get some heroin? Mm. And it's the same, you know. So fulfillment and connection. Life. Yeah. Is the like is the answer? Yeah. So uh, as well as the physiological needs that we have, you know, in terms of needing to eat, needing to sleep, and everything else that goes with that, we have psychological motivations. Um, to be respected, to have an identity, to feel fulfilled, to feel loved. People who, a lot of people who become addicted to drugs don't have those needs met. And instead of forming connections with people, they form connections with drugs. Mm. And the drugs become, you know, people will say that heroin feels like you're being wrapped up in cotton wool. Yeah. That it takes all your stress away, that you're just fine for as long as you're on it. Mm. Maybe it's not the same in the sense that, that the point I'm going to make, but what I think's funny is uh, my dad smokes and sometimes I don't, well, I don't know, I'd have to ask him, but I don't think it's sometimes the nicotine, it's sometimes just something in your habit and it's that habit, yeah, mm. of, I don't, I remember people who would, you know, when it comes to smoking outside, you'd go outside to, to, to speak to other people. That yeah, connection. Yeah, social aspect to it. Yeah. yeah. So this is really interesting. So in the 80s, when nicotine patches came out, there was a, a huge optimism in people obviously stopping smoking. In that nicotine patch, you've obviously got the nicotine, so you've got the chemical hook, you're still receiving that. Only around 17% of smokers stop smoking with those nicotine patches. But if you're still getting that chemical yeah, hook- Yeah, you're smoking to get that, you're, yeah. You're, you're getting that. Yeah, 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 so yeah. What's happening to the other um, mm. 70, 80 odd percent who are still um, addicted. So why? So there's other things in the environment. Of course, yeah. There's that physical habit. You know, you might associate having a smoke when you're driving to work or when you're coming home from work. Yeah. You know, I know people who only have two cigarettes cigarettes a day and that will be when they've just come home from work. Yeah, yeah. That's my mum's the same as that. My mum does that, yeah. Funny enough, I've just, I need to start getting out of this habit, but I've formed a habit whenever I'm cooking at night, I'll always have two, three beers. And I'm worried, not worried, because like people are going to, what Slippery the fuck's it, time. what's he on about it? But every night I'm yeah. like, I'll get cook, I'll start cooking and I'm like, oh, do you know what, there's beer, and there's always beers in the fridge. Mm. And I'm like, I remember, I, I, and I've done it for like, I don't know, three, four weeks straight, every single night when I'm cooking, I'm like thinking to myself, right, I should really not, like, I should park. Anonymous getting caught next time. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it is You're so easy. With yeah, with cooking, yeah. yeah. It sounds mad, but. My, my dad was the same though, when, um, my, my granddad was an alcoholic and my dad seen that firsthand. So we always vowed after he passed away, he'd never have beer in the house for that exact reason. Cause it's, it's there. Cause it's, it's, there. it's there. It's so easy to have if it's there, isn't it? I don't get fucked up. Like, I'm not zapped every single night, like trying to like, you know, cook, but. Set your I house can... on fire. <laughs> this is a fart. <laughs> what was the story, Grace, about the rats and the, um, with the water, ah, was it? Yeah, so this can be found in this book, Chasing the Scream. So it's, I'm not taking credit for this at all, but it is so interesting. So um, I think, you know, traditionally, the reason why that we've got the views that we have is a lot of these studies have been done on rats. And um, I don't know who it was. There was um, scientists who basically created a cage and put a rat in a cage and there was two water bottles. So there was one water bottle that was just water and there was one with water and cocaine inside. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, remember this. Every single time that rat who's in this cage on its own would go to that water bottle and drink the cocaine. And until within it, probably two, three weeks, they'd die. Yeah, just until they die. Yeah. Until they yeah, die, yeah. yeah. So, you know, because of that study, we were then led to believe that, oh, these drugs are so bad. If you take heroin, you're going to die in a few weeks and this will happen. Surely heroin or cocaine? Cocaine, but, it, you know, it can oh, be related it? to other okay. drugs, other addictive drugs. It's all about addiction. So then a scientist called Bruce Alexander came along in the 80s to kind of challenge this thinking that we've got and was kind of like, well, hang on, you've put this rat in an empty cage on its own with nothing that would be fulfilling for it. Of course, it's going to drink the one with cocaine. So what he did is he developed this study where he basically created this rat park and he put everything in this cage that a rat would want. So loads of cheese, other rats, <laughs> 
that you could um, have relationships with, uh, the little assault, uh, assault like, courses like that the you court, yeah, yeah. everything that a rat would want, right? And they put the bottles of water, again, one with cocaine in it. They might have tried that bottle of water with the cocaine, but they never went back to it and they never became addicted and they really? didn't die. So why? Yeah, it's interesting. Because so they, they, they had good stuff going on in their, their life. everything else that they would need. That's fascinating. I do remember that that so, rat thing. Yeah. I think I mentioned it to Lee Butler when he was on the podcast about the cocaine, but I never heard the other side of the story. So with with yeah. the assault course, rats flying about on the assault well, course. Well, if they've and, got a good life, yeah, why, yeah. So how can that be translated to people? Yeah, exactly. And again, it's a good point. Yeah, so, really good point. I've never been in that situation, but if I was homeless and I were, you know, had fuck all going on in my life. No family, no friends, nothing to look forward to apart from this little drug. I mean, are you really going to judge me for, for wanting to have a go? Because I've got nothing else going on, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, problematic drug use really is just masking pain. And you have to look at why people are in pain. Mm. Neil Wood said exactly the same. Yeah, exactly does, yeah. the same. Especially with heroin users. Why, why well. is it then? You know what, what I don't understand? What, why aren't the government, what are the, the be- we've just heard that, you know, Drugs, people in prisons, you know, costing thirty six grand a year. The problems that are going on with drugs, the vulnerable people getting exploited, everything like that. The benefits would be you could tax these drugs. Why are they still illegal? Where's the benefit? Well, a lot of people benefit from the drug war. As in governments. As in governments, as in researchers, as in police, other agencies. A lot of people benefit benefit from the drug war. But I think really it's the attitude that we've got in society. It's because people, you know, like yourself, you've just admitted that had you not sought out this information, you would have been one of them people that's kind of like, oh, that would never happen to me or I could never be in this situation. As a society, we hold that view and we dehumanise people and we want justice and we want to see that somebody is paying for what they've done. Now, the only way, really, I think, well, one of the main ways that we can change drug laws is to educate people on this Mm. because politicians will only seek to implement the policies that the public um, are in support of, right? So, for example, if you had a new government that were wanting to come in who were really looking to be soft on crime, that does not go down well. And that's why every time a new government comes in, we have tougher laws, tougher tougher drug laws, sentences. Sentences Mm. increase instead of decrease. They want to look tough on crime because that wins votes, 